Hi. This is actually the sort of time of year, the, the season, when, uh, at least in the UK, uh, PhDs in anthropology imagine they are going to go out into the field and start their ethnographic fieldwork. Now, the pandemic and the lockdown uh, is tragic in many ways, but the issue I want to address now is the situation of that anthropology PhD student. They had all their plans, they had their methods, they, 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 they were getting enthused about just going to the place and now they can't. And they're faced with a prospect and they don't know how long this situation is going to last. Now, I have no magic wand or, or knowledge. Um, I don't know either. Uh, and it is possible that this situation, um, such that you cannot actually visit your field site, might continue for the entirety of your envisaged ethnography. And I can imagine that that feels tragic. I mean, it's, it seems debilitating. So what I want to do now is spend 15 minutes or so trying to persuade you that even under these constraints, it is actually entirely possible that you can go and conduct an ethnography that is just as original, significant um, and insightful as anything that you might originally have envisaged. So let me start with a little story. Uh, a few years ago, I had an Italian student who actually was working, doing ethnography in Italy. And then about halfway through, um, for various family reasons, um, she had to return to, to here in London. And so she continued to interact with her informants online. And after a while, she came to see me. She said, Danny, you know, it's really actually kind of interesting. Um, what I found is that those people who I got to know when I was in the field, now I am engaged with them on webcam, they, they seem much more open. They're, they're telling me things, private things, intimate things that they hadn't been telling me before. And I listened to this and I thought, that's fascinating. I mean, and we started to speculate as to, as to why that might be. I mean, for example, might it be that, I don't know, Italians with Catholics with a tradition of confessional were sort of seeing webcam a bit in that kind of light and they were kind of used to opening up um, in that particular setting. Now, I don't know. But the point is that the discussion about the confessional is, in a sense, what I think makes us anthropologists, because anyone who tells you that there is simply a thing called online and a thing called offline and this is how it would work in one situation and generalize about how it would work in the other situation is not thinking anthropologically. Our starting point is going to be that an online engagement will be different for every population you might be working with and indeed of course at one level for every individual you might be working with. And you are going to have to come to an understanding of that specific form of engagement as you would have done um, in any other kind of offline ethnography. Um, so just as there are many different offline contexts um, that you might be working with, I also want to suggest to you there are many different online context and the experience in each one will actually also be different. Now, when I am teaching PhD students uh, methodology, I kind of shock them a little bit at one point because they have to write a uh, description of what they're going to do in what we in the UK call an upgrade. And you may have a different system wherever you are. Um, and they're going to there tell the, you know, lay out the methodology they intend to use. But I would say to my students, you know, I don't actually expect you to use the methodology that you have um, laid out. Um, I think that uh, the whole point of anthropology is unlike other disciplines, we don't expect consistency in methodology. 
The reason is that for us, method is also something you learn in the course of ethnography. It's actually all based on sensitivity, an understanding of how that particular population works. Give an example. Some years ago, I was doing um, some field work on shopping, actually, in, 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 in London. And um, after a bit, I realised that what I needed to do was uh, not to just sort of go to people in their homes, but take my car, park in the road outside and phone them up like 10 minutes before I was actually going to come. Uh, because I found that this mattered, that actually English people have a thing where um, if they know somebody is going to come into their house, you know, they want to do their hair, they want to put the toilet seat down or whatever it is. And then, yeah, they're OK. Somebody can come in. And it really makes a difference to the subsequent interaction, how you do this. Now, this wasn't something I was going to put in my method proposal because I only kind of realised it as um, as the ethnography proceeded. Similarly, say I was working in Trinidad, I find in one population, people trust you and get to know you because um, you go to, I don't know, weddings and prayers with them. And the next community, it's because you go partying with them. And so you adapt to the way that particular population um, has created its sort of what you might call conditions for sociality, how you make friends and, and, and trust people. So your method is something that you learn, not something that you you start with. And I would argue that exactly the same will apply to to online. And I think if there's one key thing I want to get across here, it's this. When I use the word method in anthropology, we usually describe our method as participant observation. And some people might feel, oh, OK, that's something you do when you're in the field, right? So if you can only do now online, um, maybe you just have to kind of now just do a lot of interviews instead of participant observation. Now, I want to suggest to you the exact opposite of that. Precisely because you are going to be working primarily online, you need, if anything, to concentrate still more on the participant observation as opposed to, say, things like interviewing. Why? Because, as you yourself have appreciate, um, there were so many opportunities for prison observation that are not now going to be possible um, because you're not actually there. And so what you're now trying to do in this kind of shift to a new regime is in some ways to compensate for that problem um, in envisaging the way that you will go about your field work now. So how does that operate? Well, when I'm doing field work and, and trying to get into um, my participant observation, usually uh, my students, myself, we, we just try and be helpful, really. Um, we may um, offer, I can remember, helping to build a rose in a tropical village. Um, we may uh, offer to look after the children so somebody can do their cooking. Um, in the last field work I, I did, which was in Ireland, I just started off as a volunteer for the local theatre group making tea. Um, and then you gradually get to know people and other, other forms of participation open up. Now, I think exactly the same approach um, should work for an online ethnography. That is to say, um, you start off by seeing, well, how can you be helpful? Because you're in a situation where everybody actually is having to go online to an unprecedented degree and you're sharing this problem. So share it. Um, say, OK, maybe you have skills in uh, developing a website or um, monitoring the contributions um, and organising them. Uh, maybe you can um, create or curate uh, entertainment for somebody's child so they can get on with their cooking um, through an online uh, resource. And um, by gradually participating in community with families, online as it would have been the case offline, you get to know people 
And then organically, as it were, people start to befriend and trust and you will be invited into uh, online for into social media, on their Facebook, on their WhatsApp um, and the ways that they themselves are now having to mainly engage. And so you will be participating in the engagement they have with others as well as as with you. And that is how ethnography kind of naturally um, develops. And once again, it will depend on the specific population you're with as to how best um, to kind of proceed um, with, with becoming integrated in a particular community, who you are then, as it were, online living with for the next uh, 16 months uh, or whatever it might turn out to be. Um, now, I think that when people get engaged with this, one of the things that kind of really worries them is um, issues around ethics. And I, one of the things I want to point out is that um, I don't really think these are uh, particularly different between an online and an offline situation. Um, just as offline, you are developing uh, friendships, you're developing um, relationships, you are trying to make sure that people understand um, what it is that you, why you're there. Um, you, you want to be open about the nature of this engagement. Um, and the same would certainly be true online. As offline, that's not always possible. Um, you go into a pub in the evening, as I would do in Ireland, and you may engage in conversations with anybody who happens to be there. And you're not going to suddenly whip out a consent form necessarily, but you're going to learn from the conversation. Um, and the same would be true online. There are people in the background you learn from. Um, and there's nothing, as far as I'm concerned, wrong with that. Um, as long as um, you retain anonymity um, and you explain to the degree that you can what is going on. And if anything, I actually feel there's kind of been a decline in ethical sensibility in the last 10 years. And the reason for that has been the rise in what we might call bureaucratic ethics that actually when we discuss ethics now, it always seems to be about about consent forms and ethics committees and and essentially compliance. And the problem with that is that we then are in danger of forgetting what I think ethics actually really ought to be, which is, as in the other examples I've given, um, your sensitivity to the, the situation um, that you are in. So you want to understand what the population you're working with, what do they understand as harm? Because fundamentally, ethics is about not harming people. What do they understand by privacy? What are their concerns? It should come from them more than it should come from uh, a bureaucracy. And if you really care about ethics right now, then to me, it is overwhelmingly the case that the ethical issue you are faced by is the situation of the pandemic. There is a reason that you are doing this online. And it is because of this crisis that we are actually going through right now. So you are going to a situation where you can expect there will be anxiety, depression, maybe abuse, certainly claustrophobia. And to me, what, what is ethical is really trying to make sure that you are sensitive to that situation in your engagement with people that you are also sharing. And actually, under those conditions, it is very likely that the real kind of asset, if you like, of being an ethnographer is quite straightforward. It is that you are there to listen and that people start to appreciate that you really care about what they are saying. And that to me has always been the main contribution that an ethnographer makes to the population that they are with because people um, in almost all circumstance want that opportunity to try and in a sense hear themselves and understand themselves um, what they feel about their circumstance um, through that through those through those conversations 
And as long as there is trust, um, then um, uh, in, in that you are not going to then abuse that information, um, I think you are, you are dealing with what is effective um, ethics here. Um, I think that there is also something that you might consider, which is that um, so far I've really discussed this as continuity, as though online is kind of the same as offline, uh, because I think in terms of most of the issues you face, that is largely true. Um, but you also might want to feel, OK, got to admit, it, there are things that are going to be lost by not being able to go offline. Um, so are there some things that we might gain um, because we would have access to uh, evidence that we might not otherwise have had? And I think there is a huge amount that is actually uh, potentially available to you to compensate for what is lost. Um, much of my work as a digital anthropologist has been on the analysis of um, mater online materials. Um, for example, I, I worked with Jason Nunn to do a book called Visualising Facebook at one point. And what we did is we kind of exploited the fact that um, the visual has become so much part of everyday conversation. Um, and one result of that is there are a heck of a lot of visuals available online. I think for that particular book, we, we at least glanced at something like 50,000 different images because we were trying to look at the differences in that case between how did Trinidadians use visual as opposed to people in the UK, um, how did it relate to issues of gender and class, and having um, bodies which we could compare, um, you, you were able to do what you would essentially is the essence of offline ethnography. That is to say, you're trying to be there long enough to get a sense of repetition, of typicality, and above all, what we call normativity. What do people regard as appropriate or inappropriate? And it's, it's interesting how quickly, even online, things settle, as it were, into the normative and, and, and can be studied. Don't have to look at a vast amount like that. Um, uh, last week, I posted something on our on our website, uh, anthrocovid.com, which was based on just a few hours looking at memes um, that the in the Irish field site where I've been working and how the memes are used to respond um, to um, COVID-19, to, to the virus um, and the relative relationship between text and visual and humour, etc. Um, but there are many digital anthropologists who work with visual material. And if you go online, I'm sure you will find many resources that would be helpful. Um, so there is something that you can use. Um, now, I've been describing a situation where, with a population that is you know, deeply embedded, as it were, in online, where this kind of ethnography is possible. Um, you also have to feel, however, for anthropologists who um, are not in that situation, working with populations who may have no internet access, or when they started work with them and now they've had to leave you know, halfway through, etc. And uh, I cannot say that the same possibilities are necessarily going to be open in all cases. Um, you, you know, if you're working somewhere in Amazonia or some other area, it just may not be true. Um, so what can, what can we offer there? What can you do? I think it has to be admitted that you are likely to have to change direction. Um, and change focus. And it may be if you cannot work with the population directly, you're able to work with um, to trying to understand, I don't know, the impact of NGOs or an aspect of political economy or the state or um, the way things are presented into the media. There are many other perspectives um, that, that potentially open up um, if you accept, acknowledge um, what you are no longer able to do. And the one thing I would say, um, I think I've supervised or examined, I don't know, 80 or 100 PhDs in anthropology. Um, and it is, really is the case that at the end of the day, it is often the things that people never intended to do, expected to do, or actually had to do by default, that turn out to be uh, amongst the most interesting uh, findings of, of, their, of their project. So, in the end, what I want to say to you is this. I, I kind of 
understand that this is a really difficult time for you. Um, but uh, even if you work under the constraints that you are faced with right now, it is absolutely possible that you will come up with as original, significant and insightful as an ethnography as anyone has ever achieved in the past. And I really hope that will be the case. And I hope this has been useful.